Hello there, welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk and my review of From Dust Till Dawn, the collaboration between Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. So this is a script obviously by Quentin Tarantino based on a story idea by Robert Kurtzman uh, and it's directed by Robert Rodriguez. Uh, Tarantino also starring in this along with George Clooney, Juliette Lewis and Harvey Keitel. This film was released in 1996 and it follows the story of these two brothers who are basically psychopaths, criminals, uh, who are running from the law and they're trying to get across the border uh, and in doing so they hijack a family. They take them hostage uh, it's a father, uh, a father who's lost his wife, um, his wife died, uh, but he's also a preacher who seems to have lost his faith as a result of losing his wife. And now he's just trying to make a, a new life for himself and his two kids. Uh, so yeah, they obviously get caught up with these two brothers uh, and they, they end up in this bar uh, called the Titty Swister, of all things, uh, which just so happens to be filled with vampires. So yeah, we go from a crime movie, crime slash hostage movie, to a full on vampire film, uh, as, as you do. Uh, but yeah, is it any good? Does it hold up after all this time? First of all, I must say this was one of the first 18 rated movies that I saw at the cinema. Uh, the first was actually Scream and then I think a few months after Scream this came out. Uh, I remember all the vampire stuff being the, the, the bits that I liked most. Uh, you know I was really into it. Once, once they got into that bar and stuff started kicking off that's what I remember loving. Absolutely. I gotta say now watching it with fresh eyes after so many years I actually much prefer all the stuff before we get to the bar. Uh, that's where all the character stuff is. It's where all the uh, the conflict is between this family and the you know the the, the two brothers played by Clooney and Tarantino. Um, and yeah, it, it's almost like as soon as we get to this bar and all hell breaks loose, all that kind of great character stuff suddenly gets pushed aside for what is kind of slapstick humour and gory bits of horror which like I say it's, it's not it's not bad I don't I don't dislike that stuff it's entertaining but it's definitely a film of two halves it's like two completely separate films stuck together and as a young teenager I preferred the latter half as a, as a you know an older man not old older but compared to my teenage years I prefer the first half it must be said and I would like to see more of that film uh, but yeah so, so this film started out as it, it was kind of a deal that was brokered uh, so Robert Kurtzman owned a special effects company and they did a deal with Rodriguez and Tarantino or whatever if, if they came on board and did this film did the script and direction and whatnot they would do the special effects for it. Uh, so yeah, s saving on a huge amount of budget, plus obviously Kurtzman gets to showcase his uh, his special effects production house. Now that works quite well uh, for, for the most part. There is a lot of decent special effects in here, uh, though it must be said a lot of them have dated pretty badly. Uh, as, as far as vampires go, these aren't the best creations that I've seen. Uh, you know, I, I, even something as far back as like Fright Night from the 80s, I think did a better job in many ways than some of the stuff that, you know, is, is taking 10 years later in this film. So yeah, uh, special effects wise, it's, it's hit and miss. For me, the strongest thing about this is the characters uh, and even Tarantino as this psychotic brother, uh, he's just totally deranged, pulls in a really good performance. Uh, and there's some moments, some genuine moments of, of dare I say, great acting from him uh, in which he has this almost like childlike mind, um, but he's very good at manipulating and kind of flying off the handle without 
kind of appearing enraged. It's like he seems to remain calm even though he's doing some of the most crazy stuff and like obviously inside there's, there's a lot of rage there, untapped rage. Clooney as well, he, he's a bit different here to what we're used to seeing him. He's obviously like known for playing pretty nice guys for the most part. Here he's, he's not a nice guy at all. Um, he still has that typical Clooney charm which kind of makes this guy very watchable, makes you kind of want to follow where he's going to go. But yeah, you listen to the things he says and you look at some of the things he does, he's definitely not a nice guy. He's not somebody you would like to be friends with. The fact that we have these two rather despicable characters and yet we still want to follow them for, for whatever reason, maybe curiosity, uh, is what kind of really sets the writing apart, I guess, from the likes of other films. I think Tarantino does well uh, taking these guys that we just shouldn't like, don't like, and yet making them intriguing, making us want to kind of see where the story goes with them. The most intriguing character for me and the most likeable is this guy played by Harvey Keitel, this preacher. Um, as I say, he's a man who's lost his faith, but being put smack bang into the middle of this situation where he's confronted with things that quite frankly none of them believe in vampires it, it kind of yeah it, it forces him to accept that there is a world uh, that is spiritual that is unknown to us you know that uh, yeah it, it basically makes him re-question the value of his faith I guess and, and that to me probably for obvious reasons for anyone who knows me is the most interesting aspect of the film. I do feel however that it's not quite fully explored in the in the second half of the film mainly because we're kind of we kind of give way to all the chaos that ensues uh, but for me that seems to be the through line. It's basically his story. It's Kaitel's story in, in that respect. He's the one who has the clear arc I guess you know um, but, uh, but I, I feel like the arc isn't kind of brought to the, the most satisfying conclusion. We never get a, a real genuine confirmation either way as to whether he has his faith back or not. But I guess the fact that you know he, he is using crosses to ward off these vampires and things like that, blessing water to make it holy water, I guess speaks for itself. But uh, I don't know, I, I think I would have liked a bit more of a clear cut answer as to where he sits now in, in his relationship with God, uh, given that it was so strained or uh, pretty much non-existent at the beginning of the film. So Salma Hayek is in this as this vampire. Uh, she, she comes across as the head vampire in this place. It's never truly stated, but that's the impression you get. Uh, Santanico Pandemonium. Now, they will go on to revisit this character in the third film in his franchise, but yeah, he... Uh, She's essentially here to do a rather provocative dance, which I feel like maybe Tarantino wrote into the script just so that he could suck on Hayek's toes. We all know he's got a bit of a foot fetish there and this kind of allows him to live that out in some strange way. Uh, but yeah, it, it, there isn't any real character here for her. She's essentially, she's here to show a bit of flesh, do a sexy dance with a, say, a snake, and then yeah, is imminently killed off. Uh, she's actually one of the first to be killed off. So, yeah, I, I feel like they could have done more with her as a villain, stretched her out a bit, you know, make, make her be the final one to get killed. But, yeah, the fact that she gets taken out so quickly and so easily is, yeah, disappointing, to say the least. That being said, though, it is, on the other hand, quite refreshing to have this kind of, I guess group of vampires that don't seem led you know it's not like the Borg where you have a hive queen or whatever or you know like traditionally with vampires you get Dracula at the top and he has his women or you know you might have a head vampire you know head of the family or whatever they, they kind of dispense with that here um, or you know if, or if she was the head it doesn't matter she's gone now so it's it's more just whatever you see around you is either a threat or an ally um, so yeah it's just carnage in that sense so I do like that in in one aspect it takes away that predictable nature of having that final 
badass vampire that everyone's going to have to come up with and is more powerful than everyone else. On the subject of power though, these vampires, they're a bit strange because they clearly have power, they clearly have strength, and yet their limbs, their body parts can be torn from them with ease. And there's a character at one point in this uh, goth sex machine who, who points that out. He's, you know, he, he's kind of thinking out loud and talking about how they're, they're very strong and yet for some reason you can just grab them and pull them apart. That to me is a little bit of a contradiction, shall we say. I, I, it's, I don't see how something that can be so weakly put together could then punch someone across the room. Uh, but hey ho, whatever. It just adds to the carnage that they can kill them so easily. Um, but it does kind of also make me think that these vampires are pussies, really. You know, I, I like my vampires to be a bit stronger, a bit more of a threat, shall we say, rather than something you can just punch a hole through their heart and that's it, game over. There's a few scenes in the first act that are quite unnerving in many respects. And, you know, it lays out the stall pretty early on. For the kind of characters we're dealing with so you know when we start out we have this uh what what appears to be like a liquor store robbery at the beginning uh, and that, before we realize that you know these guys are on the run they've got hostages um and yeah this this police officer come the sheriff comes into this this place and he doesn't realize these guys are here um, and you think he's kind of going to be a pretty big character a main character because he's got quite a big scene here lines of dialogue and stuff but no, he just gets blown away, back of the head, and then the, the store clerk, uh, yeah, has a bit of a miserable fate as well. Uh, it, it, it's a rather amusing bit when uh, his, his kind of dead body is kind of stuck in this fire with popcorn around him, and the popcorn starts popping. It's just, yeah, Tarantino keeps on finding ways to inject humour, I guess, into these moments that you know, on the face of it are actually quite horrific. Uh, there is one moment, however, that we don't get to see, which is perhaps the most horrific of all. And we, we kind of see flashes of it. So uh, Clooney's brother, he goes off uh, and he leaves Tarantino's character with, uh, with this woman that they've kind of kept hostage. And he goes off, he watches some TV and he invites her in to come and sit on the bed and watch the TV with him. Um, and then that's the last we, we see of her, except for some flashes when uh, Clooney's character comes back and finds out that uh, Tarantino has, has, has killed this woman. I, you know, he's, he's, he's killed her on the bed and we just get these little flashes uh, from, 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 from what Clooney is seeing. Um, and that, that's like the most horrific scene in the entire film, even though we, we don't really get to see anything. But it's, it's just, I think it's just because you care about this woman, even though we don't know anything about her, you don't you don't need to know a right lot about her to know that, you know, she's she's a woman who's in a, a spot of bother, she's very vulnerable, and and you're, you're scared for her. Um, so the fact that the worst possible thing happens to her, even though we don't see it, it again, it really makes you hate these characters. Uh, it really makes you kind of see where they're coming from and that they're not our heroes uh, so yeah um, and it also kind of tells you how much danger our real heroes are Keitel and his family uh, once they get together you know uh, and throughout the film you, you're always kind of fearing for them and, and no one's ever truly safe here with these two guys hanging around. This film does have a pretty kick-ass soundtrack as well there's a lot of kind of Mexican flavored kind of music to it uh, but yeah I, I, you know, it's kind of part and parcel with Tarantino and Rodriguez the films they make they do tend to have <clears throat> pretty kick-ass soundtracks and this is no exception so all in all this film kind of sits pretty much in that bracket of films that Tarantino and Rodriguez did for a period you know the whole grindhouse stuff this sits very well alongside something like Machete. I would say it's better than Machete, but yeah, it definitely comes from that school of filmmaking. Uh, I, I think it's one of the better ones that we've seen uh, for, from, yeah, from these two filmmakers. I, I'm, I'm not as big on their grindhouse style stuff uh, as I am with their, with their other work, but this is definitely one of the better ones. Um, I'm going to give it a four out of five. 
but that's only just a four. I did tie with going with a, th a three and a half for this. But like I say, that first, first half is really engaging, really great stuff. And the second half, though it doesn't live up to that, it's still a lot of fun, uh, even though some of the humor doesn't quite hit its mark. Special effects are a bit outdated. Uh, yeah, and like I say, the, the character arc isn't quite as solid as I would like it to be. Uh, but all in all, a fun ride, four out of five. But what about you? Have you seen From Dust Till Dawn? And if so, what did you think about it? Comment below, let me know your thoughts, and until next time, cracking.